How are you doing, Jerry? I'm good. Thanks for being with us. An August group. Yeah. So, is it like nine months since you acquired AC Milan? Not even. I think we, we signed it in June and, and acquired it in September. There you go. So, thank you for being here with us. You, you haven't really spoken much publicly about AC Milan, so we're really excited to have you here and hear more about. Maybe we could start like, what prompted you like to buy this club? Um, and kind of what's the vision behind it? What, what kind of your, is your thesis? Well, look, as I think you know, we've talked about this. We've been investing in sports for over 20 years. Uh, and our business model for most of that period was really the business of sports. It was partnering with rights holders uh, and creating terminal value businesses around those rights holdings. Um, New York Yankees, Dallas Cowboys, the NFL, the players themselves. Five years ago, uh, we started looking at the landscape and we said, well, what if we vertically integrated uh, and became the rights holder ourselves? And so this journey really began over five years ago. We did a deep dive into European football. I'd always been concerned about European football because when you look at the ecosystem and the capital that it attracts, mm -hmm. it would seem that um, you know, guys like us competing against sovereigns probably isn't a good idea. Um, but I give full credit to Billy Bean who you know, educated me uh, and it just shows you, you know, I, we, I was doing it for 20 years and you, you, you don't really know anything. I mean, you yeah. can always learn something in sports. And he said, you know, you're not looking at it right. You know, European football really is money ball. And um, there's a tremendous opportunity there. Also in the U.S., you know, there's ownership restrictions as we've seen. Totally. Uh, and so we have an opportunity to vertically integrate and do what we do uh, as the rights holder ourselves, and bring everything on the field and off the field that we have available to us to this. And in terms of like... You, you picked, so you, you first bought Toulouse, then you, you kind of much bigger deal to buy AC Milan for $1.2 billion. Can you just maybe kind of like, what, what, how do you turn, I think you, you said this is an undervalued asset, there's like a lot more that can be done. Uh, what can you do with AC Milan? Well, look, we, we were around it for, I think, close to four, or over four years. Um, you know, we, we're not the kind of investors that just show up and buy things, right? We don't write checks, we write business plans. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, everything is, is around a business plan. Everybody's got money today. You know, when I started doing this 20-something years ago, showing up with capital was actually the competitive advantage. Now everybody's got money. So what good are you, right? So you got to own better. Uh, and so, look, I mean, it's real simple. I mean, AC Milan is one of the great brands in European football. When do you have an opportunity? There's tremendous scarcity of value around these assets. Uh, that's why you see these NFL teams trading for the values that they trade at. Obviously, the economics around that, when they all come together as 32 owners, is pretty powerful. But, you know, it, something like AC Milan, uh, you know, it's, I, I didn't know it, you know, until I started researching it four or five years ago. I mean, it's got the second most Champions League trophies in history behind Real Madrid. Uh, it's an under-managed asset. Um, and frankly, you know, when you look at everything that's going on in the continent versus England, which we'll, I know we'll talk about, there's tremendous opportunity for us to do what we love to do. We love to bring our commingled capital and operating capability to an ecosystem and enhance it. And that's what we're going to do here. So, I mean, in, in Italy particularly, we've seen a lot of foreign investors, particularly other uh, American investors. But you have to tell me, I'm not like all the other guys. Can you explain how you're different and like what, what, what do you, what, how do you differentiate yourself from the rest? Well, look, I mean, for us, we love building businesses. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned of what I'm seeing today in, in uh, the capital that's chasing sports. I mean, sports is, there's been a bubble around sports for some time. This is not a new phenomenon. I would say the euphoria around sports and the things that I'm hearing concern me a little bit. I mean, when, the moment you start talking about sports as an asset class, I think everybody should just stop for a minute and think about that, right? Um, now, we have the benefit of longevity. The way we bought AC Milan speaks to that. You know, there is a virtue and continuity the way we approached AC Milan. I'd say Elliot did a hell of a job in the four years that they owned it. Um, they really got it to a place where someone like me now can take the baton and take it to the next level. That's tremendous. Uh, you know, I'd say that you know, a lot of the, the distinction, I, I don't really compare ourselves to other people. Um, I know that our model has worked. I've got 20 years to show that our model has worked. And you know, it really comes back to the whole point of when we look at AC Milan, we look at the ecosystem, start mm -hmm. with that, and we write business plans. I've got three constituents in the ecosystem. I, I, I have Syria, yeah. I have the fans, uh, and you know, when we look at that and we look at the municipality of Milan as the third constituent, there's a real opportunity for us to bring transformative capital, a company building mentality, and you know, professionalize the way these assets are run, managed, and to deliver a value proposition to the community. I mean, this last panel that I just heard, 
You know, I'll tell you guys, I mean, you know, there is no doubt that there is a public-private partnership in European football. You have to embrace it. Mm -hmm. In America, we don't have that. America, the owners own the teams, that's it. Uh, and the fans, you know, are, come passively. In, in Europe, you can't do that. Well, we have a phenomenal fan base in Italy. We have a phenomenal fan base in Milan. Uh, when you look at our last Tottenham game uh, in, in Milan, uh, it was the single highest grossing game in Italian history. And our average attendance is the highest in Syria, and it's the fifth highest in all of Europe. So, you know, the fans are doing their job. Yeah. You know, our job is to do our job, right? And our job is to deliver a value proposition to those three constituents, and that's what we intend to do. We'll come to the stadium in, in a minute. One of the things that, like, talking to kind of some of the fans and kind of, the, the, kind of the, in the media, there's questions like, why is Jerry not following? Why, why is he not at the stadium every, every Sunday? Why isn't he kind of more present? Um, and I, like, what's your kind of response to that? You know, it's a derivative of everything I just talked about. You know, it's not about me. You know, I, I, I was lucky enough to cut my teeth in my career at Goldman Sachs. At Goldman Sachs, they teach you to start a sentence with we, not I. So this concept of personalized ownership makes no sense to me. You know, these things are very difficult assets to run. And if you really subscribe to my view, which is you're, you have a job to do, it's, it's Bill Belichick. If everybody does their job, you know, we'll be successful. But everybody needs to do their job. The constituents, the people that, you know, manage and own these, you know, and to, and to do this properly, the, the, you know, you've got to have on the field expertise, you have to have off the field expertise. So it's got nothing to do with me. I know, I know historically it's been about the individual, mm -hmm. but I just think that that's an antiquated notion. If, you, if we want to come in and, and transform this ecosystem, responsibly. We have to bring a team mentality. So yes, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I want to win just as much as everybody else. I'm on the phone multiple times a day to our management team. I wake up in the morning thinking about this, I go to bed at night thinking about this, but my showing up isn't going to change anything. My job is to, is to make sure that I provide the resources that we can be competitive. You know, everybody wants to win. Mm -hmm. uh, no one's more competitive than me. I want to win a Scudetto and I want to win a Champions League every year. The reality is the reason why these assets have the scarcity value that they do and they trade at the premium values that they do is because you can't control that. That's the beauty of sports. It's not TiVoable, yeah. right, in the old days. Uh, but what I, focus is on, what I focus on is what we can control, and that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be responsible for. And to do that, it's a team effort. It can't just be one person. So one of the things that, like, again, one of the questions of Marx is about, there's a lot of former Elliott people, uh, your CEO, your CFO, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Elliot kind of played an important role in kind of lent you, kind of gave you a vendor loan to buy the company. So there's sometimes there's questions like, what is the relationship between Redbird and Elliot? Uh, and yeah, so we oh. think a good opportunity to clarify that. Look, look, Redbird and Elliot really get each other. Um, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Paul Singer and Gordon Singer. I did not know them before this. Uh, and um, I'm very, as I said, I was very impressed with what they did with this asset in four years, particularly impressive because they don't have any real experience uh, in investing in sports assets, but these guys know how to drive cash flow. The fact that these assets trade on a multiple of revenue is a joke, right? That's just lazy, okay? These things should trade on a multiple of cash flow, okay? And so I don't subscribe to any of that stuff. Elliot's the same way. And so, look, you know, they're one of the most sophisticated investors on the planet, so I had to pay a real price for this, okay? <laughs> and I did, but because I've been around this for four years and because I apprenticed, you know, in European football and I spent five years and met with close to 200 teams and, you know, we did, we did invest and we invested in France and we invested in England, you know, I, I had a viewpoint as to what the business plan would be in AC Milan. I wasn't just showing up to go buy something. And, and so I, I, part of that you know, determination that I, uh, in, in that business plan formulation was that there was a virtue to continuity. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I said to Elliot, when we were doing this, you know, I, do you want to continue to stay involved? And so roll, I'll put you in a different part of the capital structure. Redbird owns 100% of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I absolutely value them in the capital structure because you know, they're, they're really smart guys. And then, and then even taking it to the next level, we took one of their, their two, two of their top guys, and of their own volition, I didn't do it, they, they raised their hand and they said, you know, we're both Italian, yeah. we're based in London, we'd love to come back to Italy, it's a family life decision. Um, you know, could we put our hat in the ring as you were looking for someone to replace Ivan, who did a nice job there, Ivan Gazidis? And I said, sure, I said, you know, and, and, and we did it, we, marked, we vetted them with everybody else, and sure enough, what a surprise, you know, they're great 
you know, uh, as CEO and CFO. And the reason why that also really works is because they're very much commingled as part of our team. We're mm -hmm. very hands-on. So going back to your question about me, it's not about me. Yeah. I've got really talented guys all around me. Uh, and so we have a very diversified team that is responsible in a very Belichick-like way for all different aspects of this. And that, ver there, that continuity, I stand by that 100%. I think it's one of the smart things. We're, you, know, you see a lot of guys that go into sports and they come in guns blazing. And, it, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of vanity and ego around sports. And, you know, the one thing I'd say, you know, we're all type A people, but I, you know, we just don't have that. So and you're Elliot not going to tell have... Pioli who to put on the, on the pitch? <laughs> no, as I said to you, Belichick, do your job. Some, some new owners in the Premier League like to give advice to their, to their coaches. Look, we're smart. I think I heard it up here on the panel. We're smart guys, just like all you guys. We, we're commercial. I mean, it's not rocket science. We're not curing cancer here. But there is, there is an experience level. And what we can do is we can bring, we have a data analytics business. You know, we, everybody uses data today, so gone are the days, you know, per the old Moneyball movie where mm -hmm. showing up with data, like showing up with capital is a competitive advantage. But the way we use data, I think, is differentiated. And so we, on how the margin, so? look, I mean, everybody's got access to the same data feeds, but how you, how you use that, how you look at spatial positioning, for me, it's very simple. It's like, it, it's all ROI on goal efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how players position themselves to increase their own efficacy and scoring and their own ability to increase those around their ability to score is what that's about. And that's, and so we're looking at that. So you're going to, in terms of continuity, like you're going to maintain the same discipline on also transfer fees and sense that you're not going to go crazy. Like again, in the Premier League, we see some new owners spending incredible amounts of money, not necessarily with great results like that. Um, is that, is that like, are you going to maintain that discipline of like keeping the cost under control? What do you think? As an AC Milan fan, we, you know, we'd like a great yeah, but, player, here, but, 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 like, but here's the thing. Look, you know, I, 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 I cut my teeth in sports 20 years ago with George Steinbrenner, mm -hmm. uh, who was a visionary. Um, and as I've watched and I've lived with them for the last 20 years, and I watched the transition from George to Hal Steinbrenner, uh, and, in, and I learned so much. I learned what works and what doesn't work. The, the real secret here is you can't buy wins. You can't buy championships, right? Uh, and you know, our job is to lower the amplitude and the volatility. What's our job, right? What's the job in this transfer market? And what, what's the whole point of it? The whole point of it is not to attract the kind of capital that is endless, that you can just keep overpaying for things. The point is to lower the amplitude and the volatility so that you consistently perform. If you consistently perform, the value of your team is going to go up. And importantly, mm -hmm. in the public-private partnership, you're going to deliver a value proposition to that very important partner that you have in the fans. Right? The fans, the fans want, we all want to win. We all want to win a Scudetto and a Champions League. But that's, if, if that happened every year, if the same group won every year, what's going to happen to the value of the team and the value of that ecosystem? Right? That you want the excitement of, of human nature, right? So you want the Serie A to be a competitive league. I want it all to be competitive. I want everybody to be competitive, yeah. right? I can live in that. That's, that's Wall Street. I mean, that's, that, that's great. That's, we're not rigging the system. Yeah. But, what, but what you can control is consistency. And that's what our job is. So you've invested in, like, kind of Redbird manages a number of assets. You've reached, recently resurrected the XFL, which is kind of an alternative football, American football league, um, rather than a rival in kind, of, in kind of cooperation with the NFL, which is interesting. You have history kind of like kind of in the concessions and ticketing business. You have you own Toulouse, you own kind of part of, uh, of um, the, the Rajasthan Royals cricket team in India. How do you connect all these things in, in, in a way that like, is, are there any synergies there? Look, I mean, it, there's macro and micro synergies. I mean, every, we are in the business of monetizing intellectual property, right? We are cash flow drivers and cash flow builders. When you look at everything that uh, we own in our portfolio, there is a contiguity to it. I mean, we brought the New York Yankees in you know, to invest with us in AC Milan. Why did we do that? Yeah. Because our fundamental macro investment thesis is that AC Milan is one of the great global brands in European football and in the world. Uh, it's the number one brand in Indonesia. It's one of the top brands in China. Uh, and it's a sleeping giant. Uh, so who better to bring us alongside of us than the New York Yankees to sort of look at that with us and say, what's the art of the possible? So we're, we, we want to commingle everything that we do with world-class people, world-class owners of intellectual property, world-class intellectual property in and of itself. And so, you know, when you look at the XFL, you know, we bought the XFL out of bankruptcy. I did it in partnership with Dwayne Johnson. Uh, Vince McMahon did a hell of a job launching this once, doing it again twice right before COVID. We bought it out of bankruptcy and uh, we partnered with the 
with Disney and ESPN as our broadcasting partner. We also partner with the NFL as their development partner. We took a very fundamental approach that spring football should be part of the NFL ecosystem. When we invest in sports, I think one of the things that's really important is you can't just go and, 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 and treat it like typical private equity guys where you're going in and buying something. You've got to think about what's the ripple effect in the ecosystem. So with XFL, it was we're going to be part of a responsible participant in American football. Guess what, when you, when you step back and you look at it, American football doesn't have a development league. It doesn't have a minor league. Well, in, during COVID, when the entire offensive line of a team went out because they were sick with COVID, they couldn't, they couldn't have a game. There was no one to go to. They had to go literally to ex-football players who were driving Amazon delivery trucks. Well, now, how does that make sense? Right, so there's, there's, a, there's a legitimacy. Yeah. I'm always about legitimacy. What's the legitimacy? So similarly, we're gonna take the same approach when we, in the stuff we're doing here. So you, you mentioned private equity with, with a tinge of disdain there. Like, um, why, I mean, there's been talk, I mean, in the past, kind of private equity has been, like, kind of part of the story is that private equity has been investing a lot in sports. Why, why that kind of, are you, not, are you not a private equity firm? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think you have to define private equity. Uh, and um, we get lumped in with a lot of different um, aggregators of capital who, you know, under the moniker of private equity, um, you know, I look at when I retired from Goldman in 2013, I, in my own mind, I, re I retired from private equity. Private equity is, you know, n no disrespect to it, but I mean, it's a little bit of reverse m and I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the metrics for success in private equity are raising funds, right? Metric for success at Redbird is building businesses. Mm -hmm. That's not, one's not better than the other. It's just, that's what I want to do with my life. I don't want to do the, I did the other thing for 20 years. That's all. So when you look at sports, it just so happens, we're not smarter than anybody else, it just so happens that what gets us up every day plays really well in sports. You know, we're unemotional, we're cash flow buyers and builders, uh, and you know, we love monetizing intellectual property, uh, and we're responsible participants and think about our impact on the ecosystem. Yeah. Right? It's a little different than you know, deploying a ton of capital, parking it, and, and just clipping a coupon. That's not something that, you know, anybody can do that. But if you're gonna do that, don't charge two and 20. So earlier I was trying to push uh, the, the head of Serie A, uh, Lorenzo Cassini, and see whether he's gonna let private equity buy, buy a stake in Serie A. He was very tight-lipped. He didn't really let much go, but we know they were there before. It didn't happen. We know that there's interest to get in. What, how would you feel about a potential uh, investment of, of private equity funds in in the league? Um, I'm not a buyer of that, and I'm not a supporter of that. Why not? Uh, again, you, you know, I, I start from the premise that today everybody has capital. So showing up with capital isn't the point. The point is, what's the, what's the purpose for the capital? And you can't determine the purpose for the capital unless you have a business plan. So what's the business plan? Why do you want capital? Why, why, why are these leagues that are the, the aggregators, the portals of all this intellectual property, why are they allowing themselves to be subordinated you know, with, with debt capital? Why are, they, why are they mortgaging their future? So instead of getting $0.100 cent dollars going forward, they're going to get $0.50. Cent dollars. When you look at the aggregate dollars that are coming in and you split it across 20 teams, what's that going to do for you? So I don't subscribe to that at all. I think, you know, when you look at, if you look at the continent, forget about England for a minute, when you look at the continent, you know, if you look at England, start with England, there has been a corporatization and a professional institutionalization of ownership in England, mm -hmm. right? That hasn't happened in the continent. The only two institutional owners, I think, on the continent are Redbird and the owners of Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, we have a responsibility. There's an impact, a positive impact we can make. So if there's going to ever be a discussion, as, as long as I'm around in Syria, if there's going to be a discussion about bringing in that kind of capital, uh, we're going to sit down and have the discussion. We can be self-sufficient ourselves, all right? We're here, okay? We're that you're saying that you'd be keen also to invest in the 100%. league? A hundred percent. So that's new. One hundred percent. The owners should own, right? And so part of what we want to do is we want to get our fellow owners together and say, you know, what do we want to do? How do we do better? We have a media deal that we're going to have to work on. There are other things that we can be doing with Lorenzo. Uh, and, his, and his colleagues. There's a lot that we can do here. You know, when we bought into AC Milan, as I said to you, there are, what did I say, three constituents, the fans, mm -hmm. right, Syria, right, and the, and the municipality of Milan. Those are the three constituents, and we want to impact all three of those. And so we've got work to do. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but we don't need to, we don't need to look outside of our ecosystem to be self-sufficient. That will never happen. You've been crystal clear on that. Um, stadium. 
if anybody like me that reads the, the, the Italian sports press obsessively, we know that you were in Milan yesterday to meet with the mayor and the governor of Lombardy. There's been discussions for a while now about San Siro, whether you'd stay there, whether you'd build a new one. Can you tell us a bit what, what's, what's going on in your mind? Maybe some, some idea of what happened yesterday? Sure. Look, you know, again, when we, when we bought AC Milan, we did not underwrite build a new stadium. Um, uh, there hasn't been a new stadium in Italy since 2011. The Juventus one, right? The Juventus one. That's a 40,000-seat stadium. Uh, obviously, we're very w aware of the importance of San Siro in Italy, in Milan. Um, but, you know, when you look at the brand of AC Milan and you look at where I think Serie A should be and all 20 owners in Italy should be, um, one area that is underutilized and underperformed is the infrastructure that brings the live event to the fans. Mm -hmm. Again, it's about delivering a value proposition, right? How do you deliver a value proposition to the fans? Well, yes, you have to perform, you have to win. Um, I'm, a, I'm of the view that you're not going to pre-legislate a championship every year, but you can be consistent. But, you know, they, we, they should have access to world-class infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, we are, we are been evaluating you know, different sites, including Nexus and Zero, to see what would be possible. Now thinking about also our partner in the Milan municipality and you know, the, in the Lombardy region. Um, and I think we can build, bring real value. I think we can transform, you know, when you look at Milan, I have to I tell you, you know, up until recently, when I invested in sports, it was always with the view that there was a Venn diagram between sports and media. Uh, and I have to say, you know, I give real credit to LeBron James and Maverick Carter, who taught me you're missing a third leg of the stool. Third leg of the stool is culture. In mm -hmm. America, culture is urban. In Europe, it's fashion, right? We're sitting right there in Milan, and we don't have an ability to, you know, our Live Nation is one of our partners. We don't have an ability, really, to bring Live Nation in to program any of this infrastructure and, and on the back of the AC Milan anchorship, you know, bring other forms of entertainment to the community. So you see that at the moment, Sincero doesn't allow you to do the kind of, to kind of fulfill your vision of like bringing Live Nation, kind of that kind of live. You know, look, it's, it, it, the stadium was first built in 1920 uh, and it was renovated over the years. Uh, I'm just simply saying that there's an opportunity if we want AC, Mil we want to return AC Milan and Syria to the world-class table, which I believe they deserve a seat at. You have to do it in the full 360 degree, degree flywheel. Uh, and part of that's gonna be the infrastructure. I always come back to, I wanna deliver a value proposition to our fans, and it, and it all feeds on itself. It's all integrated, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it's, it's nothing other than that. Now, you know, we're gonna see if we can find the right opportunity. If we can't, we can't. Yeah. Uh, but we're, you know, it, has to be, it has to work for the fans, it's got to work for the Milan municipality, it's got to work for the, the Lombardy region, it's got to work for Syria. You know, everybody's going to have a voice in this. And something that is also kind of slightly unusual outside of Italy, like you share the stadium with, with Inter Milan, would you, if you, you know, there's complications and like you, I'm not saying you need to commit, but if you could pick, would you do it on your own so that you're your own man? Look, I mean, you know, we had a hand in building Yankee Stadium and Dallas Cowboys Stadium and um, the company we created, you know, went on and helped build SoFi. You know, we have a real experience in doing this uh, and also programming um, the various uh, revenue streams in those stadiums. So, you know, our, our instincts are, you know, we can be self, I'm a big believer in being self-sufficient. Um, nothing's off the table. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'd say, um, you know, with regards to you know, Inter Milan, I, you know, I know, I think they're thinking through what their future is going to be. And so all I can do is just focus on ourselves. And so I'm going to see what the best decision is for us. Absolutely. Um, we're running a bit out of time. I have one last question, then open to, to the audience. But like Super League, we didn't really, mm -hmm. I mean, that's dead for the time being. Um, but is there a world, something I'm curious, like whether you'd be interested in considering a new format of the Super League, maybe involving the other major European uh, leagues minus the Premier League. I'm, 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 as, as an Italian, I feel I can be a bit of an, a, a Brexiteer of, 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 of English football, so on, on ver in the reverse. Well, look, on, on the Super League, I think you have to, the Super League failed, so it's no point in talking about that. The point, the point really should be, why did that occur? Uh, and the reason it occurred is what we alluded to earlier, which is that there has been a divergence between England and the continent. You've had, you know, the inst I call it the institutionalization of the corporatization of ownership in England, and by virtue of that, it's attracted capital and it, and it just flows through the ecosystem. The continent's behind on that. And, that's, and what this is about, 
The Super League, while it may not have been executed in a way that worked for all the constituents in the ecosystem, which you have to be cognizant of, you know, it was about leveling, making the field more competitive across the board. That's a good thing for the ecosystem. You know, I want all the teams in Syria to be competitive. I want the continent to be competitive with the Premier League. That's good. That's competition's great, right? It enhances the value of, of, of the teams and the leagues. The question is, how do you do it? Um, I do think there's an opportunity for us. If, if, if Serie A gets its own house in order, League One, La Liga, there's an opportunity to also collaborate amongst, our, amongst the leagues as well. Um, but we've got to walk before we run. Okay, I was going to take some question from our digital subscribers, but our iPad seems to have died. Um, does, do we have any questions from the audience? We'll take maybe one or two, because we're very much beyond the... So I can't, I can't see. Can you mention who you are and... Hi, uh, Aaron Casanova from FT Strategies. Jerry, I wanted to book, uh, just ask about your uh, stake in Redbird and FSG and also the kind of ongoing sale or non-sale of the minority stake. How do you think that this has gone down and how, how do you perceive it yourselves being a shareholder in FSG? And how do you react to rumors, for example, of Libpedia wanting um, to take up some of that minority stake in Liverpool? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What, tell me the focus. The question again. What? What? What's as you, as Redbird is a um, right. shareholder in FSG. How do you react to the news of the ongoing kind of oh. sale, non-sale of the minority share in Liverpool? Given that FSG is the yeah, look, I, I think you know this. As, as I'm learning over here, I mean, things things tend to get a little ahead of, of the situation. Um, you know, I think uh, our partner in Liverpool, Mike Gordon, who is you know really the visionary and thought leader in that, you know, is I think looking to uh, retire, and there was an opportunity to uh, may, uh, see if there was a, a way to replace him uh, or buy him buy him down. And you know, as part of that, there, I don't think there ever was a, a driving desire to sell Liverpool. Um, I think we're always going to be opportunistic, and it was simply that. You know, we're the we're uh, a minority investor in Liverpool. I would say it's probably the only time I've invested in something in sports where I'm willing to be a junior partner to somebody, and that's a function of the quality of that management team and that ownership group. I think they're one of the best in sports globally, uh, and so you know, I just think there's much ado about nothing. To be honest with you, I didn't quite understand why there was this much uh, publicity around it, but so be it. I guess we one last question up front. Can you just state your name? Uh, Luca Bianchini here from La Gazzetta dello Sport Italy. Uh, everybody here in Milan is, is talking about your priorities, your choice for the stadium. We are wondering which area will be, will be you are going to choose for the stadium. Of course, I, I I'm not going to ask you to give us an answer, but maybe you can just explain which are your priorities. For example, if staying into the municipality of Milan is a priority for you or, or not. Thank you. Yeah, yes, it, I think in, in a perfect world, yes, it would be. As I said, you know, my three, the three constituents that I think we have a responsibility to make our partners and, and to enhance their involvement are the fans, the municipality of Milan and Syria. Uh, and so if we can keep ourselves in, in the municipality, um, you know, we will look to do that. But it's got to work for everybody. Uh, and, you know, there hasn't been a new stadium, as I said, in Italy since 2011. I'm not sure why that is, and, but I'm, I'm, it doesn't really matter. I'm interested in seeing if we can come in and make a positive impact. But it's got to work for all those constituents. So we'll, we'll evaluate it very openly. We're unemotional about it. We don't have a, a pre-existing agenda. We're just going to try to figure out what's the best opportunity for all the constituents, including ourselves. Right. Jerry, yep. it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks, James.